The Bible Project. They have really cool videos. That was a great uh, summary video. Welcome, y'all, to the eight. We are in part four of a series titled How Not to Be a Fool. And the opposite of being a fool is to be wise. And like all of us would want, all of us want to make better life decisions. All of us want to attain wisdom. But for many worldviews, wisdom is hard to grasp. I showed a video in the first week of someone defined wisdom to be knowing that tomato is a fruit and not adding it to a fruit salad. That's wisdom is to know that tomato is a fruit and not adding it to a fruit salad. So it's hard for us to grasp what wisdom is. Some people think wisdom just means you have gray hair or you've lived a long life or you've had like tons of life experiences. So but these are all theoretical or you cannot grasp what wisdom is, right? It's evolving. It's nothing you're able to contain as far as what wisdom is. So this entire series is for us to look at wisdom, but we've actually connected two things. The art of asking questions and attaining wisdom. The art and skill of asking questions and attaining wisdom. This is one tactic, this is one strategy, just at a psychological level, for us to be able to attain wisdom and for us to be able to make better life decisions. Because I, I guarantee you, all of us, all of us, we have made life decisions in which we look back and we regret. Where, how, how did I decide to move here? How did I decide to marry this person? Maybe, maybe that's your question. I don't know. But we've all had questions where, like, how did I get myself in this position, right? We all have regrets when it comes um, to looking at certain life decisions that we've made. So a few of the questions that we've been looking at over the past few weeks is, first one, am I being honest with myself? And we added a second layer to this question saying, am I being honest with myself for real? Because... Our reflex answer is saying, yeah, I'm honest. I'm, tr I'm being truthful with myself. But we need to go past that superficial layer. Am I being honest with myself of why I responded this way, of why I, I did not want to be next to that person, of why I responded this way? Like, I, why did I shoot that email that way? Why did I send that text that way? Why did I, what my body language was whatever. So I, am I being honest with myself for real, right? That was our first question to kind of remove that layer in order for us to attain wisdom. So we kind of embraced that stressful question. Am I being honest with myself? The second question is, what story do I want to tell? What story do I want to tell? Because every decision that we make compounds on top of each other and eventually tells a story. Like how I am as a father, as a parent, I'm writing a story. So what, decision, what story do I want to tell at the end? Like if I think of the end in mind as far as what story I want to tell, then that motivates me to make certain decisions. We kind of looked at a beautiful story from the sixth century of someone named Joseph. Uh, from the Old Testament and from Jewish scripture, in which he was in a very difficult position of a woman who's wanting to sleep with him. And because of his wisdom, of him being a type of Christ, him reflecting the fullness of wisdom, the person of, of, of God, he was so wise and saying, what story do I want to tell? Do I want to just fall into this trap and sleep with this woman and this get the best of me? Or do I want to say that I pushed back and I reminded myself, no, God has a great story planned for me. I cannot do this and sin against God. He had such a beautiful, wise optics of how he looked at this situation because he understood what story do I want to tell. And I shared with you, this is an emotional, personal thing for me, is I want, you know, at the end of, of, of my life, whatever God, however God wants to make it, hours, days, years, whatever he wants to make of it, I want my kids to be able to look at me and say, yeah, I, I, I want a guy like that. I want to be a guy like him. I want to marry a guy like that. That's the story I want to tell. So what story do we want to tell? So that's the second question. And the third question, I know it might sound a little bit cheesy here, but our third question we're going to focus on today is, is there tension that deserves my attention? Is there tension which deserves my attention? So all these questions are coming from a book titled, this entire series is coming from a book titled Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And this book, is, honestly, is focusing so much on the head, right, of how to make psychological decisions is really speaking to the mind. But we're wanting to sync up this head-level knowledge as far as how to make better decisions with a more deeper-rooted spiritual reality. Because the holistic approach to us being making better, wise decisions is for us to understand, yes, we are intellectual beings, but we're also spiritual beings. We're trying to attain the fullness of God. So both have to go hand in hand. So this third question in which we're going to kind of digest together is there, is there tension that deserves my attention? Have you guys ever been in a situation where like you're making a life, you're, you're making a decision, but 
we fall into the trap of making a decision as far as what's best for me, what's convenient for me, is this good, is this bad, am I hurting anybody? And then I make a decision just off of that, right? I make a decision purely off of that. But then somebody might ask you a question like, are you sure you wanna do this? Or have you thought about this? Or somebody might ask you that, sec that question. <laughs> you might be tempted to dismiss them. This is someone, someone might ask you something. Sometimes it's a parent. Sometimes it's, it's a loved one. It's someone who's maybe close to you, they ask you that question. Like, are you sure you wanna do this? You feel like this is the right move? There's a temptation a reflex to dismiss them. Why? You wanna be in control of your life decisions. You wanna to continue to move forward on making that call of dating this person, of marrying this person, of taking that job, of moving, whatever. You, you, you still wanna move forward and you dismiss them. The entire thing, just in case I lose you, what we're talking about today, embrace the tension of that question. Embrace the tension of that question. Like, that you might be offended. You might question why that person said that to you. Embrace that tension. Is there tension? that deserves my attention? Is there tension which deserves my attention? Why was I offended when my spouse said this? Why was I offended when I got that email? That tension right there, before you dismiss it, before you build a completely different narrative, embrace that tension. Why are you feeling that way? Why are you wanting to react this way? Embrace the tension that is there. Ask yourself, why is this bothering me? We fall into the trap of wanting to be in control of our decisions. And there's this fictional story that builds up in our mind. Well, I'm going to make decisions and no one understands me better than myself. So I'm going to move forward with this. And you, you begin to push what other people might give you advice for. Or they might ask you a certain question for you to think of things from different angles. But you naturally want to dismiss it because you want to be in control. You know what disappointment is? Like if you kind of take a step back. Disappointment is that you wanted to be in control. You had a certain expectation. It didn't happen. So now you're disappointed. It's the desire, in a nutshell, it's the desire of wanting to be in control. The desire of wanting to be in control. Because we want to dismiss that tension, dismiss what that person might say. We want to dismiss that advice or that counsel I might give. Maybe you have a negative view of that person and they ask you that question, so you connect the two. Oh, that's such a dumb question because it came from a dumb person. And you throw all of it out the door. This pushes us away from the fullness of wisdom. So this is why we need to grasp the question is there tension that deserves my attention? Last week, we focused on a figure, a character from Jewish scripture, which is a type of Christ, which will come in full circle next week about what all that means. But today, I want to look at a, a second person who reflects uh, the person of Jesus or reflects the fullness of wisdom, which is, he goes by the name of David. He is a psalmist, as you can see from his Coptic Orthodox icon here, uh, Coptic art. He's, he's holding an icon. And maybe many of you guys might know the story of David and Goliath. We see that reflected in his icon there and him being a shepherd. So these are just highlights of certain things of his life. You see him with a crown because he was the second king of Israel. But before I jump the gun here, as far as before he's the second king of Israel, David was a young boy. David was a young boy. And he was appointed from a young age where a prophet told him, God made it clear to him that you will be the king of Israel. You will be the king of Israel. So he knew from a young age that God has ordained him and appointed him to be the king of Israel. But there's one little issue. There is already a king of Israel, right? And his name is Solomon. There is, sorry, his name is Saul. Saul, there's already a king of Israel. But David knew that eventually he would have to be. But can you imagine the tension if you're king and you knew that there's already another king coming? You, 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 the control aspect of all of us is, I don't like this guy. I want to be in control as much as possible. So deception, pride, control, ego, authority consumed Saul to the point that he went to go chase and wanting to kill David himself. You guys with me? We have the one king of Israel named Saul. David has already been appointed to be the next king whenever Saul passes. So Saul is wanting to hold on to control in his position as long as possible to the point that he's wanted to control the narrative and wanting to come and chase down and slaughter David himself. So Saul goes on a mission to hunt down David and his group, his troops. So you have a group here, Saul and his posse, his troops, and you have David and his friends running. So it's, you know, it's kind of a Tom and Jerry thing that's happening all throughout Israel, right? Saul is chasing down David and trying to find him and trying to hunt him down and trying to kill him. So far, so good. This is where the story gets fascinating. David and his group gets word that Saul is close by. So what do they do? They kind of hide, hide behind some rocks, hide in some caves. They hide so that way they don't get caught by Saul. 
So what does David do? Him and a few of his friends go hide in a cave. Some time goes by. Somebody comes into the cave to go potty. The person who comes into the cave to use the bathroom is no other than Saul. King Saul comes in, right? He wanted to go use the restroom. He's in this cave. But of course, you know, his eyes were kind of, his pupils are still dilating from being out in the, in the Middle Eastern sun. He's going into the cave. You know, you can just imagine, you know, he's pulling up his, probably wearing something similar to me, and he's trying, you know, he's trying to pull it up. All right? Don't think about it too long, but you know, he's trying to adjust, and he's sitting, he's about to go to the bathroom, right? And David's seeing all of this. <laughs> I have it in front of him, right? Saul's eyes are probably still adjusting because of the, 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 the light outside and the dark, so he can't really see. Here's David. Imagine you being in David's position right now. The king of Israel is going to the bathroom three feet away from you. You have an opportunity to slit his throat right there. Right? You, you, you could actually even build the super spiritual story of, saying, of David saying, God has delivered his enemies right into his hands. David could have easily been like, thank you, God, for everything concerning everything and everything, for you have brought my enemy right in front of my lap. Thank you, God, that you, you have always protected me, and here's my enemy in front of me to, 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 for me to kill. Right? David could have built the super spiritual story of here, God has brought my enemy in front of me for me to, 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 to slit his wrist. Sorry, to slit his uh, throat. David could have easily done that. But David embraced attention that deserved his attention. He began to start to ask himself, what story do I want to tell? Do I want to tell my great-grandkids that I was appointed to be the next king of Israel, and then the king was in the, the cave going to the bathroom, and that's when I killed him? Can you imagine? Can you imagine his great-grandkids great telling, oh, daddy, great-dad, great can you tell us that story, that time that you killed the king of Israel and while he was going potty? You're so brave. You're so big. That's an awesome story. Can you tell us that story, David? I mean, I mean, but, but David realized there was a tension that deserved his attention. He could have easily made an emotional decision, which I think all of us can say, validate, that's a valid thing to do is to kill Saul right there. For crying out loud, King Saul was trying to chase down and kill David. So David had an opportunity to kill Saul himself right there. But David embraced the tension that deserved his attention. The soldiers who were with David, as you expect, were pushing David, saying, dude, what are you doing? Get out your knife and kill him. Like, he's almost done with the bathroom. Kill him. So they were trying to push him. How does David respond? Him, being so wise as a leader, he embraced the tension. This is his response. David said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Pause. David is saying, I mean, think about it. He has every right to make an emotional decision to kill the king of, of, of Israel. And he pauses and says, No, who am I? Saul has been appointed by God to be the king. Who am I to change the narrative? He has been appointed by God. As annoying as he is, as much of a control freak he is, who am I to change the narrative? What God has appointed and ordained, who am I to change the narrative right now and take control of the story myself? Look at that wisdom. He continues. Or, or this is the narrative from 1 Samuel. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. <laughs> a nice detail of this story, if you look at it in, in scripture, David took his knife and cut part of like the, the garment of like Saul's like clothes. Like while he's using the bathroom, he took his knife and cut a part of, of his clothes. And he held, held on to that without Saul knowing. While Saul was using the bathroom, Saul didn't know. David took, took out his knife and cut out part of the cloth from Saul's clothes. Saul finishes using the bathroom. He goes back out, didn't even notice David and his group being in the cave. So as Saul is going out, and there's 3,000 of his troops with Saul. Here's David, imagine, David now is on, on, top, of, of, on top of the cave where, where Saul just went to the bathroom, right? And he's looking down, and he sees Saul with all his groups. So David says, hey, he gets his attention. He's getting Saul's attention. Saul's trying to find David. But David, with his boldness, gets his attention. 3,000 men, including Saul, turn around to see where that voice is coming from. And they see David. And David says this, May the Lord judge between you and me, Saul. 
and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand won't touch you. Look at that strength. Look at that integrity. Look at that wisdom for him to speak with boldness and to get Saul's attention. Of, 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 of this, of, there, there's attention that David was paying attention to. He got Saul's attention after he had an opportunity to kill him. And he says, I'm not going to be the judge. God will be the judge between you and me. God will be the judge between you and me. I'm not going to take control of this. There's a tension that he embraced, but he left God to deal with the outcome. And you can find the rest of the story. It's extremely fascinating, obviously, in the Bible. But let me take a slight left turn in this conversation real quick. If you look in history, specific church history, A.D., if you look at the first 1,000 years, there was a full understanding of how to view and interpret and meditate on these ancient Jewish scripture. There was a full understanding and clear thought. So here we have the story of David having an opportunity to kill Saul. You have tons of different stories throughout scripture from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there are different ways in which to interpret it. And this is what causes tens of thousands of different denominations of Christianity. But what's so beautiful about ancient Christianity, orthodoxy, this church, is that there is one mainstream thought process of looking at scripture and how to interpret it and how to meditate on it. And what's so beautiful, this map in pink is highlighting many major cities around the Mediterranean Rim, in which you have different church leaders who are giving beautiful meditations to this specific part of, of scripture and giving a meditation that's all following the same thought process. The Greek word is phronima. They had the same mind of the church. They understood the fullness of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And you have different people. You have people from North Africa. You have people from Italy. You have people from different parts of the Mediterranean Rim who all had the Holy Spirit was working within all of them to be in sync of how the church should be full and have this wonderful continuity of what Jesus established. So I'm, I'm just wanting to highlight this. I'm wanting to give a background. All of this, if you go to seminary, this is all called patristics, or studying the writings of the church fathers, especially in the first 1,000 years as you see this one main thought process of the church. And I want to highlight with you, I want to share with you two people, one from North Africa, one from Italy, who had the exact same thought process of how they meditated and commented on this part of scripture that we just read as far as the tension between David and Saul. St. Ambrose of Milan. Milan is in what country? Italy. So St. Ambrose says these words. What is virtuous was preferred to what was useful. Let's pause right there. You, their, their writings are so deep, so you gotta have to process and digest it together. What is virtuous was preferred to what was useful. So here, here St. Ambrose is making a meditation. David was meditating on what is the virtuous thing to do as opposed to what is useful. Because the useful thing is to kill Saul. That's the useful thing to do. Here's my opportunity to kill the one who's trying to kill me, so I'm gonna kill him first. Right, that's valid, that's justifiable. He thought that was useful. But here, St. Ambrose is meditating on the wisdom of David for him to say what is virtuous. What David desired to, to pursue what is a, a virtue was preferred to what was useful. And then St. Ambrose continues. And then usefulness followed on what was virtuous. David eventually became king. He, that became useful later on. That's, that's his story. But he didn't fall into the trap of saying, what's useful for me? His wisdom allowed him to pause and digest and absorb the tension and to embrace it. This is what allowed him to make a wise decision. How many of us, when we make decisions in life, we fall into the trap of what's useful, what's beneficial for me? And we end up having life regret. Imagine if we had the thought process of like, what's the virtuous thing to do? What's the wise thing to do in this position? And here's St. Ambrose from Italy in the year 380 AD. Have this beautiful meditation of the wisdom of David. You have St. Ambrose of Milan from Italy. And now I want us to look at St. John Chrysostom. He says these words. I love this quote. Stick with me on this, okay? You're going to need to think a little bit deeper with me. It was not as leader of troops, you see, but as priest David commanded them. 
He's giving a meditation of how David taught his troops. The troops that were trying to egg on David saying, kill him, kill him. He's, under, he's almost under the potty, kill him. So David is, tra David is trying to teach his troops. St. John says this. It was not as leader of troops, you see, but as priest, David commanded them, the troops. And that cave, this is a beautiful meditation. That cave was a church on that occasion. Like someone appointed as bishop, he delivered a homily to them. It's a homily, a sermon. David gives a sermon, he continues. And after this homily, he offered a kind of remarkable and unusual sacrifice. Not sacrificing a calf, not slaying a lamb, but what was of greater value than these. He offered to God gentleness and clemency, sacrificing irrational resentment. He killed that resentment that was within him. He slayed anger. How beautiful is that? He slayed anger because he had every right, justifiably, to make a decision purely off of anger to get back his resentment. For crying out loud, can you imagine being chased for months and years? from someone who's trying to kill you. You, 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 wanted, you desired an opportunity to kill the one who's trying to kill you. But David decided to kill resentment. He decided to slay anger. Talk about wisdom. How many of us? You know what's the sad reality? You and I have been hurt by someone's words that they have said out of anger. The reality is, too, you have said something to hurt someone else out of anger. You have made a decision. I have made a decision because I lost sight of wisdom with a capital W. And I've hurt someone because of my words. And I'm sure you have too. That, can, that is a huge regret for many of us. And you know, the, the sad part is, it still rings in our heart months, sometimes years later. It sits there. It sits there. The power of our words. And here is David in his wisdom being bullied, like, in his mind? He's, think, think of the tension already in his mind. This is my opportunity to kill Saul. So he already has the tension in his mind. Then his friends are also telling him, kill Saul. So he has another tension point already within him. So he's fighting uphill, right? Because, I mean, think about it. He wants to do it in his head. His friends are telling him to kill him. So it's understandable that he wants to follow the same path as well. But he paused. He paused. He embraced the tension that deserved his attention. I love that. I love this beautiful quote. He gave a sermon. David gave a sermon. Not by, okay, guys, let's start. Let me give a sermon. Everyone sit down. Let me the No, he didn't. No. By his actions. By his actions. He gave a sermon. Your actions of how you lead at home and at work and in any capacity, you are a leader because you influence other people around you. If you realize it or not, that's a guaranteed fact. You are giving a sermon by how you conduct yourself, of how you lead yourself, of how you attain wisdom, of how you not make emotional decisions, of how you pause, embrace the tension. You ask yourself, well, quite, what story do I want to tell? For you to embrace the question, am I being honest with myself? I can't remember the name of the church father saying, if you know, tell me. Where someone says, I've regretted the times I've spoken, but I've never regretted not speaking. I'm totally killing the, the quote. But he says, there's times where I've regretted speaking, but, there's but most of the time when I don't speak, I don't, I, I don't have any regret. I'm killing it, but I'm just kind of, I'm sharing. Our words cause pain and division sometimes, but we need to pause and ask yourself, what's the wise thing to do? Yes, you might need to come with boldness and articulate yourself, but sometimes our words can have a generational impact. It requires us to attain wisdom because words hurt. And here is David giving a beautiful sermon, not by text, but by his actions. And that cave, the potty, was the church. Because David taught them something, a lesson of how to attain wisdom. I want to leave you with this, a beautiful quote by a book in the original Orthodox Bible. It's titled, The Wisdom of Solomon. The Wisdom of Solomon. This book is part of the original Bible, as I mentioned. It is actually written, it's following the same mindset of King Solomon and his wisdom, but it's actually written by a Coptic person in the first century BC, 
um, from Alexandria, but this is part of the Bible of wisdom. He says this. For wisdom teaches self-control, discernment, righteousness, and courage, concerning which things there is nothing more valuable in the life of man. But also, if anyone longs for a great experience, she, wisdom, knows the things of old and portrays the things to come. Let's, let's digest this for a second. But also, if anyone longs for a great experience, she, the personification of wisdom, knows the things of old and portrays the things to come. You know what, you know, you know, you know what this, this passage is saying? Wisdom is knowing that the decisions I make today are going to affect tomorrow. That's wisdom. Nothing is in isolation. She knows the things of old and portrays the things to come. You can predict where things will go. If I look at your lifestyle and habits now, there's a natural prediction of, of, pro of projecting what will happen in the future. There's a natural projection. So what story do you want to tell? How can I attain wisdom? Because the things of old and portrays, and it will naturally portray the things to come. She, wisdom, understands subtlety of words. Wisdom understands that I need to articulate myself, but how I package my sins can make all the difference to bring healing and managing conflict, or it could cause tremendous pain that puts a tremendous wedge in this relationship. Wisdom understands subtlety of words. Do we understand the subtlety of words? Or sometimes we speak out of anger, out of emotion, out of pain, which I get. We've all been there. But what if wisdom, Jesus, settling in our hearts, can give us the wisdom to speak with boldness and articulate ourselves and understand the delicacy and subtlety of our words and the impact it can have? I pray that these questions cause us to be uncomfortable. Am I being honest with myself? What story do I want to tell? And is there a tension when I'm making this decision? Is there a tension that deserves my attention? I promise you, if these questions roll through us in our relationships, at home, at work, it's whatever you name, if we embrace these questions and apply it to our lives and anchor ourselves in the reality of God's unconditional love, this is where we can attain and abide in wisdom himself. Let's stand for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, our selfishness, our pride, our mentality of what's in it for me enslaves us, rips us away from healthy, edifying relationships. But Lord, you are the definition of wisdom, that you have come down to restore humanity. Lord, we are seeking wisdom, not of this world, not from online, not from our own mind, but from you being the source in wisdom, you being the definition of wisdom itself. Lord, we pray that these questions, not just these questions alone, but anchoring these questions to you and your love for us, this is what allow us to live a more enriching, fulfilling life, and for us to be able to see you working more clearly in our lives. Lord, I ask that this series impacts us not just at a head level, but at a heart level, something we're able to apply in managing conflicts and issues and struggles in our lives. Through the prayers of all your saints, Lord, hear us as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, guys. We will wrap up this series next Sunday. You don't want to miss it.